Good morning, everybody. Turn with me to the book of Judges this morning. Father, we thank you for those that are watching by social media. Last week, I think I had a, an awesome crowd of 144 people. You know, I'm going to read something to you here out of the book of Judges. I believe that we are experiencing some of what we're going to read here this morning as a nation and as a Western Christian culture. And uh, it, it seems like we are in one of the most intense spiritual warfares that we've been in in a many, many, many years. To see how fast a third gender was promoted amongst the West is amazing to me, which it shows me there's an extreme attack against identity. And then the most shocking thing is to see the weakness in the church and the lack of dedication and how ministry seems to get in the way of everybody's agenda. And I've noticed how many people will come to church on a special meeting, but God forbid if they ever plug themselves in. And so the churches are not getting stronger. They're actually getting weaker. And it's unfortunate, you know, when we see the power of the gospel of Jesus, that it has the power to change the hearts of people. But yet God won't do it without your cooperation. And so the so what I feel this morning is such a seriousness of the hour. And unfortunately, it'll fall on deaf ears to 80% of the people that listen to it because it's not important to them. But at the same time, your children and grandchildren will be affected. When Jesus called the, the, his disciples together in Matthew chapter 10, the first thing he did was he gave them authority against unclean spirits. And what we're seeing in this hour is a release of unclean spirits like never before. So it shows, just wait a second, Jonathan, don't be amen to me every time, just wait a second, okay? Because I want people to understand the seriousness of the hour, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. And in the book of Judges, we see three generations. We see the generation of Moses. Now think about it when God raised up Moses, think about this for a minute. The people of God had a covenant with him. And I, I'm convinced that there was a time when they really enjoyed that covenant. And they were walking in the blessings of God. But little by little, they lost their rights to Pharaoh, who had a monarchy. And Pharaoh's laws ruled the land, not God's. And bit by bit, the people surrendered their liberty voluntarily. It wasn't taken by force, but little by little, they surrendered their freedom. And that's what's happening in the West right now. Little by little, we've been surrendering our freedom. And we don't want... We don't want freedom and liberty. We don't even understand it. This generation has no idea what it really means. What this generation wants is just another master, a better master, a better plantation, but not freedom. But yet thousands of people have paid the price for freedom and liberty, true freedom and liberty. And if you watch what's going on in television in the United States, we're seeing the fabric of our nation being ripped apart absolutely ripped apart. And I don't blame the devil for that because he has a ministry and he's very faithful to his ministry. You'll notice he shows up to church on time. He stays late. He's very active in ministry. So I don't blame, I don't blame the enemy for doing what he's doing. What I blame is the apathy amongst those that have experienced the power of the gospel of Jesus. So what we learn in, in, in the ministry of Moses is that God heard the cries of his people by reason of their taskmasters. You know, 
the word taskmaster, there, there's a group of people called tax collectors. You know, it's amazing to me. We put up a couple of banner signs out here. We got a fine of $500 for each parking lot because we put a, a feather banner up just on the hours of church, and they gave us a $1,000 fine One, on a Sunday morning to have code enforcement come here and give us a $1,000 fine. Because we had a banner that said, welcome. When in, when in history has the cities had such, such gall to send out code enforcement workers on a Sunday morning to go attack churches? Because they probably don't have a $50 permit. Permission. Permission. Please, squire. Please, master, may I put a sign up that glorifies God? May I? So we live in a time when Moses heard and responded to the call of God because God heard the cries of his people. But, you know, that just shows how merciful God is. But who wants to get to that place where we have to cry out to God for help because we as a people did not know there's consequences for electing the wrong people to represent you. How is it that we have homosexuals that are in Congress that are rep- how How is it that money flows so freely in those realms, but yet in the churches we're working with nickels and dimes, man? We're praying for miracles all the time, financial miracles all the time. But yet last year there was $428 million dollars that funded the gay, lesbian, and transvestite agenda. $428 million is a lot of money. Not to mention the billionaires. Where are the Christian billionaires? Why is it that? Why is it? Think about it for a minute. We look at all of us. I mean, if we took all of our assets, everybody in this church's assets, and put them together, how much money would we have? So here we are, we have a a mandate by God to take dominion, to be prosperous people, to be productive, to multiply, subdue and take dominion, and yet we're not doing it. Because, you know why? Because we're all too busy with our own agendas. Instead of putting our kingdom assignments first, giving first place to God, we put everything else first. Well, we've got this, and we've got that, and we're going to play soccer this weekend, and we're going to go to the football game, the baseball game. And we're going to do all of these things that get in the way of what God wants to do. Now, I know, I know, I know, it's falling on deaf ears. See, you guys are the remnant, so you'll listen, but we are the remnant because there aren't many of us. I believe there's enough of us to change the thing, but somebody's got to stand up and say something about it. You know, it used to be the ministry of the prophet. But the prophetic ministry in the West was hijacked by Jezebel. With the manipulation and the control and the spiritual abuse and, and making covenant and ties with the, with the religious spirit, where prophetic ministry was reduced to nothing but personal prophecy or directive prophecy, where the Spirit of God tells me you're good today, you're good tomorrow, and you'll be good the next day. And it just degenerates into all of these prophecies about all these things we're going to get, kind of like a politician. And yet we get nothing because those prophecies came out of a man's spirit, not out of the Holy Spirit. And so we've lost that, that edge of what God would use the prophetic ministry for, which was turning the hearts of man, to turn the sons back to the, to the fathers and the fathers back to the son. Least I smite this earth with a curse. But yet today, listen, in 1970, 25% of black homes had no father in them. 25% in 1970. One generation later, 77% of black homes have no father in those homes. I think that's a serious issue. But people are afraid to say it because, after all, you know, we're all racist today. Everybody's racist. We even have environmental racism, whatever the heck that means. I don't know, but, you know, there's terms. All these terms are flying all over the place. 
So what we have is we are finding ourselves in the middle of a spiritual battle. So we have to understand how to fight back. But you know what? People don't want to go to a church like that. They want to go to the one where I could be kind of a part-time Christian. You know, there's no such thing as a part-time devil. So we have part-time Christians trying to fight a full-time devil. And I give thanks to God for his mercy to hear the cries of us, even though we are in rebellion, and even though we are apathetic. In other words, thank God that he hears the cries of his people, even though they've been, they have been malfunctioning. And little by little lost the very things that God said belongs to us through our own apathy. So God found a Moses, one man, think of it, one person that would sell out to him. I'm just praying that that person's here. That there's another person that would sell out and say, God, you know what? I'll do what you said to do. And God said, Moses, Moses. I've heard the cries of my people, and I've come down to deliver them. Go and confront Pharaoh. Now, when he's talking about confronting Pharaoh, he's not just talking about meeting, having a personal uh, an invite to Pharaoh's palace so he could say, I've been with Pharaoh. I was invited to the White House. I was invited to Pharaoh's house. I am now the man. What it says is that he is confronting a system that has fallen apart and has captured his people. And God says, I've got to find somebody that I can send to deal with this. And so God found Moses. You know, when Moses came down off the mountain, you know, he didn't go to the masses and tell the masses what was going on. You know who he talked to first? He talked to the elders. You know who the elders are? The gray-headed folks. And the people that still had hair. <laughs> he talked to the elders, those that had been around God for a while. And what's really interesting to me is that after Moses spoke with the elders, that they went out then and began to talk to the people about what God said. And what's interesting to me is, you know what they said? They said, God has spoken with us. Now, they, didn't, they weren't up on top of the mountain in the presence of God in the burning bush, but yet they embraced the words that came out of Moses' mouth. In other words, they're saying, this warfare, we are embracing what we need to do in order to get free. They had heard the voice of the Spirit coming out of a man, and they, they grabbed a hold of it, and they said, this is our fight, not just Moses' fight, yeah. but this is our fight. But today, we applaud the preacher that breaks out and says something, but we won't support him. Because after all, we've got that Rodney King spirit. Can't we all just get along? And we want to get along with those that we should not try to get along with because of the demonic strongholds that are in the territory and in our regions and in our nation. But if we don't stand up and make up the hedge, get in that gap and make up that hedge, then who will? And we're trying to put too much responsibility on our preachers instead of on us. So then what happens is Moses dies. You know, I look around and I see the, the old generals that we had, the generals of the faith. The Brother Hagans finished their course. Brother Summerall finished his course. These great giants of ministries have now finished the race, but now they have passed the torch to us, and we have to ask ourselves a question. Do we want that? Should we embrace it and call it our cause? That's what David said. Is there not a cause? He reminded his brothers in the midst of the challenges of Goliath. He said to his brothers that they were professional military men. And he said to them, why are you, why are you in fear? Is there not a cause? No hay una cosa. Is there not a cause, a reason why God has saved us and brought us out of spiritual death into spiritual life. Don't we have a real reason why we are living? And David said, 
who is this uncircumcised Philistine? You see, David saw himself different. How you see yourself determines your approach to God. If you see yourself, well, I'm just a little humble servant girl and there's nothing I can do. Let me tell you something. A little hum- humble servant girl can influence the whole house. Amen. Just ask Naaman who influenced him. A general. So Moses dies. Moses dies. And up behind him come Joshua and Caleb. Had been hanging out with Moses. Watched the mighty signs and wonders. And Joshua, who had spent most of his time in the presence of God, God called him. Where's our young Joshua's today? Where are they? Here's where they are. They got thumb ministry. (laughs) And they're superstars within the video realm. That's our, that's our Joshua's today. We don't want that old school Christianity. No, but you want to play all these video games. What champions you are. Distraction, 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 distraction. So God finds a man. He finds Joshua and he finds Caleb. And they begin to walk in the power of Almighty God and the demonstration of the Holy Spirit. I give thanks to God. Now I know why Caleb lived so long. It was necessary. It was necessary. I get where I don't even want to watch the news anymore. Because you see the warfare manifesting. Let me tell you this. The reason it's manifesting is because we haven't won the war in the spirit. Because that which you don't win in the realm of the spirit manifests around you. And this devil is doing everything he can to get rid of us men. Trying to get us out of the house. This spirit keeps calling us names, calls decreeing over us that we're obsolete and we don't need, that, that women don't need us. The world doesn't need us, and the progressive socialists tell us that the family is the problem, that it needs to be destroyed so they can build their utopian, whatever is in their goofy minds. There is no utopia until the Prince of Peace comes back. It's just fake control and fake manipulation by demonic spirits that have a different agenda than God does. Man, I pray for the, for the prophets to rise again. I pray for them to rise again. Stop telling us how wonderful we are and start helping us fight the war. But because we don't have an understanding of apostolic ministry and prophetic ministry and how they work together, what happens is, you know, when that strong prophetic burden comes on the warriors, the pastors who are so insecure don't know what to do with them, so they run them off. Or the prophets get so discouraged, they're like, forget about it, you know, and they go about their business. But the insecurity in ministry is unbelievable to me. You know, this is not, this is not a competition of who can preach the best. And we've got to tell our young fellows and our young ladies, look, it doesn't matter how good you preach. What matters is have you been in the presence of God? What are you carrying that God gave you that you can impart to us? What is the anointed upon your life? Amen. So we have to shake ourselves. You know, this is what, this is what Paul told Timothy, his, his spiritual son, one of his spiritual sons. And it's interesting that Timothy had a man of God speaking into his life like that. You know, proof of sonship is found in, in correction. You know, as soon as I correct people around here, bang, gone, gone. They tell me they want me to correct them, but when I do, no matter how tactfully, no matter how much diplomacy, no matter how much people skills that I have, he don't understand me. And people start defending themselves. I'm like, what's up with that man? 
You know, you're, you're telling me you had a need for somebody to speak into your life and tell you the truth in love, but then, God forbid, if we actually do it. You know, what the, you know why? It's called rebellion in here, man. We're so rebellious, it's amazing. And we're acting like Jews. God told the Jews, you're a stubborn people. And now God can say to the Gentiles, you're a stubborn people. So God sent Ezekiel to go deal with them stubborn Jews, didn't he? He said, harden, he said, harden your head because you're going to deal with some hard-headed people. We call them today knuckleheads. You know why they call them knuckleheads? Because you got to, knuck, you got to do that to get their attention. See, we have to preach like this to stir ourselves up because that's what the Apostle Paul told Timothy, his son. He saw something in Timothy that was taking him in the wrong direction. And he said, Timothy, stir yourself up. Don't forget what happened to you when I laid hands on you. When the anointed came upon you, don't forget that. And he said, you stir yourself up. You do it. You do it. You stir yourself up. Get ready again for that fight. Embrace the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Yes, what he did. See, it takes, it takes that kind of anointing to stir people up. But then the Holy Spirit watches your reaction. The Holy Spirit watches your reaction to what he is saying. So we have to have, you know, the word comes to those that have ears to hear. Some people come to church just to find a girlfriend. Others come to church just to learn from me what they can do to go build their own ministries. So you don't want to help here. You want to go start your m M&M ministry, your breath mint ministry, your hand lotion ministry, your hair supply products ministry. Come on, somebody. I'm telling you the truth. So the motivation of coming is not to hear from God so that you can help advance the kingdom of God. It's so you can advance your own money, your own paycheck. Now, I submit to this, if you'll put God first, if you'll put his house first, then he'll help you build his, your house. But we got to get the order right. And I'm so stirred up in my spirit about this fight over manhood. And I give thanks to God for the strong men that we have in this ministry and in this church. Thank God for them. Let me tell you guys, you're important in this hour. You are so vital in this hour. Women have done a great job of holding the church together for the last 2,000 years, but they can't do it without you. We're asking them to do more than they're able to do. Don't let the devil work you to death. Get in your position, men. Become that leader God's called you to be. Be strong in the Lord. Not just in your bank account. Be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. That's for men, not just for women. You know, the Holy Spirit, you know, I, went to, I had this incredible burden on me. I went to the Lord in prayer to find out, what is this? And the Lord said to me, he said, and it was, I was praying about all these attacks against, against men and manhood and, and, and just trying to wipe out our gender. Just trying to wipe out our gender. Just wipe us out. And this devil is trying to create a third gender. There is no such thing as a third gender. I mean, that's just goofy demonic stuff. That's delusional. And I, and I was praying and the Lord spoke to me and I believe it so clearly that he said, I started this thing with a man. He's talking about Adam. And he said, I'm going to finish it with a man. We have to understand the importance that we have as men, how important we are to the church of Jesus Christ. Ladies, don't be afraid of your man. Understand how God made him and benefit from that. Support that. God called, you know, you have in your nature, ladies, you have this, this amazing ability to create and to multiply. That's why God gave you a womb, the place of production. 
the place of reproduction, the place of growth and increase. That's why I tell men, men, if you give your wife a house, she'll give you a home. If you give her groceries, she'll make you a meal. Whatever you, if you frustrate her, she'll give you hell. <laughs> because she's designed to produce. So guess what, man? You need to give her something to produce. You know, if you don't help her with vision, she'll find another man that will. A man should never bring a woman into his life without having a vision first. All you're going to do is frustrate her because she's designed to produce, amen, to help you succeed and help you be the champion that you've been called to be. So Moses dies, another generation comes up, Joshua comes up. And look at this in Judges 3, you forgot, you forgot that I was going to go here? <laughs> All right, let's look at, this one's probably better, let's go to chapter 2 first. He says, verse 1, And an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochum, and said, I made you to go up out of Egypt. In other words, I created you for deliverance. And I have brought you unto the land which I swore unto your fathers, and I said, I will never break my covenant with you. Hallelujah. But look what happened. In the midst of this goodness, the goodness of God, verse 2, And you shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land, that's called what? Instruction. Can you see instruction here? Say this with me. The instruction I obey determines the benefits I receive. Did you hear that, Facebook? My 144 viewers. And you shall make no league with the inhabitants of the land. You shall throw down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. You've not obeyed my voice. So here there was instruction that was not obeyed. So when you don't obey instruction, you get the results of that disobedience. But you've not thrown down the altars. You've not challenged the university professors. You've not spoken the truth in love. You've compromised. You've stepped back. You didn't want to be plugged in. You wanted to grow at your own pace. You just wanted to get along with everybody. Wanted to go to the church where you could sip and smoke a little bit. Just take a hit every now and then. You just want to go to that place where, you know, you don't have to sell out. Mm -mm -mm. I just want to, like, I want to put my toe in. Yeah. Why are you holding on to that liquor, man? He said, you've not obeyed my voice. And then God says, why have you done this? In other words, this doesn't make sense. Wherefore, I also said, I will not drive them out from before you. That would have made me cry. If God would have said that, that would have made me rip my garments and fall on my face right there and say, God, please don't leave me. Please, please don't leave me. Don't make me fight alone. But God said, I will not drive them out from before you. Continual warfare. But they shall be as thorns in your side. Everybody feel, ever feel like you had a thorn in your side? And their gods shall be what? A snare. Their gods shall be a snare to them. Their leaders, the elected officials, that other voice, that other government, 
will be a snare for you. And it came to pass when the angel of the Lord spoke these words unto all the people of all the children of Israel that the people lifted up their voice and wept. And they called the name of that place Bochim. And they sacrificed there unto the Lord. In verse 6, we're going to see now Joshua dies. The next generation dies. Moses died, and here comes another generation. The leaders of another generation died. And when Joshua had let the people go, the children of Israel went every man unto his inheritance to possess the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua. Your granny served God. Your grandfather served God. They didn't have cell phones. They played in the yard. They had televisions. You had to get up and go change the channel. They played outside, and it was okay, and it was safe. They even knew how to go out in the yard and kill a chicken and fry it up. Today, the only chicken we want is a Bojangles and Popeyes. That's it. We want a bucket. It said, and the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the works of the Lord that he did for Israel. Can you see that? They saw. Somebody say, they saw the goodness of God. You know, we see the goodness of God today, and it's like, oh, that's nice. People are going to church for inspiration and not transformation. They want the spectacular. They want the greatest show on earth. The anointing is not good enough. I want the greatest show on earth. Give me the three ring circus. Come one, come all, come and receive your miracle. The three wing circus. It's amazing. The devil is so slick and so wild. He's got all of these tricks up his sleeves. And so now we want the great spectacular. The anointing is not good enough anymore because it requires something from us. But to make us feel good, oh, let the guitar scream. Turn the lights down. Apostle Chris was here the other day and he said that he was talking to one of his uh, co-workers, and they were talking about how they went to church and how they, they thought it was so awesome. It was just like a concert. That's not how church should be. Do we have good music? Do we worship God? Of course we do. But it's not about the concert. It's not about the light show. The greatest show on earth. And that's good, isn't it? I'm being melodramatic. Am I doing okay? I'm trying to get this in your memory, this visualization thing. Polished showmanship is not the anointing. Jesus said, these signs shall follow them believe. When did Jesus say that? When did Jesus say it? When did he say it? In Mark chapter 6, when did he say it? When did he, when did he share that? He shared it right before he, went, he, was, before he ascended into heaven. He gathered those people around and he said, You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and then you'll be witnesses. He didn't say the Holy Guitar. 
He said, you'll receive power to overturn the world, to turn it upside down. Hallelujah. The anointed of the Holy Ghost. But yet today, God forbid if we use the word Holy Ghost. We don't want the Holy Ghost anymore because we have to surrender to him our own self-will. We have to die in his presence before we can be resurrected. We have to sell out. There's something required of us to receive that anointing. Everybody I've ever met that had a strong anointing had been broken and poured out somewhere in their life. But people don't want to be broken. They don't want to be crushed. They don't want the oil of the Spirit of God squeezed out of their life. Amen. Because it's that very oil that brings life to other people. So, these people, they had seen all the great works of the Lord. But he says here in verse 10, And also all of this generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation. Where's our other generation? I don't see them here today. They're not watching me on Facebook. They don't even know. They they want to go to Instagram. It only lasts for a few hours. Don't give me anything that sticks. Don't give me anything I have, to, I have to hit delete on. Let it delete itself, because after all, I'm busy. We have a generation today that's schizophrenic. They don't even know what they want. And the Bible says there came another generation that didn't know God the way Joshua's generation did. And we have people today that don't know God the same way you do. They don't know the God that you know. They don't know the God that you know. They know church. But they don't know the God you know. They haven't had that encounter with God, amen, that that changes you on the inside. Where you can stand up to the devil and say, I'm not who I used to be. I've been changed, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm not who I used to be. I've been changed by the power of God. You know, I was preaching like this. I had a pastor's meeting. And I was preaching like this, and I opened it up for questions. You know, how dangerous is that? Let me give you that. How dangerous is that? (laughs) To open it up for questions. So this pastor, he says, I've got a question for you. Oh, oh, I have a question for you. I said, what's your question, pastor? He says, how long should a woman's hair be? And I'm like, in the midst of all of this, you want to know, that's the best question. That's the, that's the thing you must, that you've got to know for me today is, how long should a woman's hair be? Shut up. Can you imagine that? That's called a religious spirit. That's a religious devil. It's about how you look, not whether or not you've been transformed. And I said, Pastor, it's none of your business how long that woman's hair is. That's up to her and her husband. Shut up and sit down. Can you imagine? You know, you can't get that uneducated without help. (laughs) Somebody's got to help you with stupid. Demon powers in the midst of all of that. I didn't hear anything you said, Apostle Jonas. I just want to know how long a woman's hair should be you poor thing and you are a leader in a church god help us help us jesus somebody say help us jesus so you want me to get people saved and send them to your dead church i'm not doing it i think we need to hear some men preach again don't you think so 
I got to finish this up before we get depressed. <laughs> How much more time do I have? I got lots of time, right? Some people are like, mm-hmm. <laughs> ah, I'm not sure. He said, and also that generation was gathered unto their fathers. There arose another generation, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. Wow. The West is in trouble. I want to repeat this again. Prophetess Lisa was teaching the other night on the church in Pergamos. And uh, I want you to know this, that the Holy Spirit said in that, in that chapter that there was a man named Antipas which had been a faithful martyr. You know what the word martyr means? It means you die. You die for the gospel. Somebody murders you. And when you study this bishop out, it's amazing. I think he was ordained by um, John, the Beloved. That's the one that leaned his head on Jesus. That's the one, the part of that inner core, that three, okay? And he laid his hands on Antipas, and I'm sure he gave him a charge. Preach the word in season and out of season. An apostolic charge. And we know from history that Antipas was killed. He was murdered. Because he had such an anointing on him that he was dealing with the evil spirits in the region. He was casting out devils. God forbid if we did that today. Oh, I'm not ready for that. I mean, they might attack me. Don't tell me people don't think like that. My own mother did that. My mother one day said, shh, don't say they might hear you. I said, Mom, I want him to hear me. No weapon formed against me can prosper. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. So Antipas went around the region, casted out these unclean spirits. Word got back to the government. He was rocking the boat. He was making trouble. Uh And so they murdered him. Mm -hmm. They murdered him. How many people today would say, God, anoint me? Mm -hmm. How many people today would say, I want to join Antipas' cause? (laughs) How many people would want to join him in ministry? Shut up now. Don't be lying now. It's one thing for him to shoot at the pastor. It's another one for him to shoot at you. I'll join you, pastor. I guess that's what Silas did. Silas wanted to join the ministry of the apostle Paul. I can see his mama saying, no, you don't. No, you don't, son. You don't really, you don't know what you're talking about, son. But you know what happened? He joined the ministry of the apostle Paul. And the next thing you know, he's in prison. Prison ministry. (laughs) Compulsive. Said, I didn't sign up for this. I wanted the anointing man. I wanted to cast out devils. And the next thing you know, he's sitting in prison. I can see him sitting next to each other. Sitting on the bench. And Silas sitting there looking at Paul like, "Mm mm-hmm. My mama told me that you was trouble. I don't really know. I'm not really supposed to be here. And Paul probably looked over and mm-hmm. And I could see them sitting there together. I could see Paul begin to rock like this. You know, let me tell you something. When a black man rocks, look out. And I could see him start to rock and go, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, God, God. 
Come on, God. And I could see, I could see Solace starting to say, mm-hmm. Something's about to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, come on, God. Oh, show yourself strong, God. Mm-hmm. And something began to happen. And that place began to shake. And them chains started to make some sounds. Hallelujah. And the next thing you know, here came God. Come on, somebody. You're not listening today. And the next thing you know, them gates sprang wide open, man. They couldn't keep him. Amen. And the Holy Ghost came down. Hallelujah. And then I could see Solace saying, that's why I joined up with you. It's all right now. But can you imagine what would happen if we, just us in here, just us in here, man, using the authority God gave us. You know, we've got to get over us somehow. You know, don't stay bound up, man. Get free. Let's get on with it. You know, old and stupid is worse than young and dumb. That's a write-me-down for Apostle David Coker. Old and stupid is worse than young and dumb. Young and dumb can get better. Old and stupid needs deliverance. I don't know where that came from, but that's a good one. Write it down. And there came another generation. Are you still with me? Am I doing all right? Is this okay for Sunday morning? My 144 viewers are watching. I'm turning the world upside down with them today. You know, it's funny how I could get, how, you know, people that don't even know you can accuse you of all kinds of things, of evil, wicked things. You know? I like to ask them back, you know, uh, like somebody say, well, you're a heretic. I'm like, well, how do you know that? Did you just get, get that on your own or... Some demon, were you drunk? Were you high on coke? Are you one of them their opioids? <laughs> you one of them opioids, aren't you? Jeez. You know what an opioid hit an opioid is? You know, you can baffle the wise with simple statements. I've seen Apostle David do it many times. Apostle David and I were preaching. You know, by the way, the Global Cause Network conferences weren't always held here. We were holding them all over the country. I pray we can continue to do that. But we'll move them if you stop getting hungry. We'll move them if they get in your way and they become an inconvenience. If you've got so much stuff going on in your life that you can't support the Global Cause Network's gathering the remnant conference, then we'll just move it to another place. Smile at me, everybody. What's wrong with you? <laughs> we got to be committed and dedicated. You know, you have to model the way. People's got to see your hunger and your, and your, your, your uh, fervency. They'll follow you right in. But if you're standing on the sideline just, you know, chewing bubble gum, I saw this lady, this girl last night. I was at the airport in Pete, Saint, what was it? Um, Pittsburgh. And uh, these three young ladies were taking orders at McDonald's. And the one girl, she's chewing on a big piece of gum about that big. <laughs> she said, what would you like to order? And I'm like, I'd like to order a, a napkin for you to spit that gum out in. <laughs> You know, presentation is 80% of acceptance. I got to hurry. You guys are too much. But verse 11 says, The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, 
and they served Balaam. You know, we have some people today that they are more, they are more concerned about their political party than they are about the kingdom of God. You know, our help has to come from God. This system that you see around us, the wheels are coming off. The banking system is so fragile right now. This thing, I don't even, we just need to pray for the wisdom of God and the mercy of God. When you look at what's happening in the different nations of the world, when you look at Hong Kong and the and the battles that are taking place right now, just at the entrance into China, at the gateway entrance into China. And you see the things that's happening in Latin America. How about in Nigeria, the genocide? Cameroon, the genocide. The tribal infighting, the tribal murders in Uganda, Malawi, in the Congo, in Kenya, in Tanzania. The war is on. So while we're here singing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saves a wretch like me, people are being murdered. Not to mention all of the things that's going on in the Middle East. Good Lord, how do you keep up with it all? So we have to be serious about our calling. You know, I think if we are serious, that God will anoint us and God will bless us for that. But we can't be doing this kind of stuff. Am I doing okay, honey? You know what that is? No, no, not the foot. Not the toe. A toe means I'm just testing. You guys can't even see that over there, but let me just show you a little. A toe. <laughs> But it says in verse 12, and they forsook the Lord, their God, their God, the God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt. They forsook him. Think about that, man. What's wrong with you? And they followed other gods of the gods of the people. How do you locate the gods of the people today? Can anybody tell me? How do you locate the gods of the people today? Come on. Huh? Social media? What do they call them today? They call them the what? The influencers, right? Well, they got 30 million people they're in influencing. Where all of a sudden you can start a church. Not because you're called, just because you just want to do it. And let's make it about the music again. The gods of the people. How do you locate the gods of the people? All we got to do is go see how many Facebook, social media likes they got. That's what the people like. I said that the people are liking that. Can you see it? Yeah. This is who I like. Come on. This is the person that I'm drawing from. This is the person that I'm drawing from. This is the voice coming into my life. This is the voice I like. The gods of the people. Where you are more concerned about one of these influencers, what they have to say more than what God has to say. God help us, we're in trouble. You know, I used to say that people would listen to, to the prophetic voice of Weaver, Weaver the weatherman before they'd hear God. People would look at, do you know that there was a time when people would look at the weather report on television to see whether or not they were going to go to church? I'm like, are you serious? He's wrong most of the time anyway. It's the only job you can be wrong most of the time and still keep it. It's like a government job. <laughs> it's like a government job. Once you're in, man, you're in. It's like the flu. You can hardly get rid of it. I got to keep going before I get in too much trouble. So it says, the gods of the people, they bow themselves unto them. They provoke the Lord to what? To anger. Now, most of the people today think God never gets mad at anything. 
that he's so loving and so, un- so forgiving, so full of mercy and compassion, he never gets mad at a thing. He knows my heart. He knows your heart, but where's your butt? <laughs> Am I allowed to say that on TV? <laughs> he knows your heart, but where's your backside? <laughs> he knows my heart. Yeah, but you're not in his presence. People forget that God sees everything. You know, on Easter Sunday morning a few years ago, there was a man here with his family. Brought him in here, set him in here, the whole family's here, Easter Sunday morning. I watched him get up and walk out. You know what he did? He went over here, pulled up into this lady's yard that he knows, got out of his car, opened the gate, walked up to the house, knocked on the door. Lady came to the door. Hey, baby. And went and committed adultery with her. On Easter Sunday morning, I saw him get up and walk out. Left his family here. Well, a couple of weeks later, his wife's calling me. She's boo-hooing, right? She's all upset. I don't blame her for being upset at all. So I said, well, let me talk with him. So he comes in here, and he, he spends some time with me, and he says to me, Apostle Jonas, the devil made me do it. I said, he did. The devil made you do that? Wow. I said, so let me get it right now. The devil made you bring the family to church. Oh, no, that was God. I said, so the devil made you get in the car and drive over there. Yep. I said, so the devil made you open the car door. Yep. I said, the devil, the devil had you open the gate, the fence around the house. Yeah. I said, so the devil made you walk all the way up to that door, down the sidewalk, up to the door. Yep. I'm thinking, geez, man, wow. I said, did the devil make you knock on the door? He said, yes. I said, did the devil make you go in? He said, yeah. I'm like, oh, man, jeez. I said, did the devil make you go in there? He said, yeah. (laughs) And you know what I said? I said, man, you can tell your wife that all you want to, but you ain't you laying that line on me. That devil didn't have nothing that didn't do that. You did that. Let me say it again. You did that. And you had the nerve, man, to bring your family into church and leave them here in the service, knowing where they'd be. I mean, how vile is that? I mean, if I, I could have gotten the flesh, I would have gone. I mean, if the Lord would have allowed me to get in the flesh, I would have spanked him something fierce. I would have been knocking the devil, slapping the devil right out of him. Come out! I would, it wouldn't be like one of these. It'd be like, come out of there! Ladies, you better back me up. Come out! Don't you lay that stuff on me. Come out of there! Oh! You can feel that slap of the anointing coming. I mean, that's amazing, isn't it? So you know what happened, right? He left the church. Of course he left the church. So now people are asking me, what did he leave for? 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 I said, I can't tell you why they left, but I can assure you that I had nothing to do with it. What's in me is not why people leave churches. They leave because of what's in them. <laughs> Sometimes when you cast out a devil, the people will follow him. So to add insult to injury, The man starts a church. 
And some of the knuckleheads at this church wanted to congratulate them for starting their church. And I can't tell anybody anything because I don't want to damage the children, relatives. I can't say a thing. And all I can do is just sit back and watch all the accolades and celebrate this. They're having this, so let's just celebrate them. And I'm thinking, you don't even know what you're doing. And you trust them more than you do me. I've been married 43 years. It takes a while to be married for 43 years. Let me say it again. It takes a while to be married that long. The point today is this. There's another generation rising up. How we see ourselves is going to determine whether or not we can help make a way for them. We got to start seeing, I'm talking about us in here. We got to start seeing us, how God created us. That he created us to be champions, warriors, strong in the Lord and the power of his might. That he called us to invade, occupy, influence, and take dominion. That he called us to sell ourselves out. And you know, the problem with preaching it is I know people say, you know what, I, I don't, I'm not ready for that yet. This is what I've heard this for years. I'm not ready for that yet. No, but you're ready for the enemy to take out your children, I guess. Well, you're ready for drugs to get into your family, I guess. Well, you're ready for potential accidents because you're not covered anymore, I guess. Well, I guess your business is more important than God, I guess. I guess, you're, I guess your ministry is more important. Your breath mint ministry is more important. You know, years ago, one of the accusations against this church was there was a demand put on people. And I started thinking about that for a minute. I'm like, I'm preaching on love. What are you talking about? I, I gotta, I'm preaching a love message. But what I found out is that the Holy Spirit, while I'm preaching a love message, he's preaching something else over here, putting a demand on people to actually do, love somebody. Amen. And they're like, I don't want to do that. You don't know how bad I've been treated. And I found out the Holy Spirit is the one that puts a demand on us to change and to grow and to move in the things of God. So now God's not putting a demand on you to hurt you. He's putting a demand on you because he loves you and he knows we've got to get you out of that situation. We've got to get you out of the hurts and the pain and the abuse and turn you around, man, and put your feet on higher ground. So here we are in the West, and we're being invaded by unclean spirits. We're being overrun with them right now. I've never seen the rapidness, the speed of this thing, how fast this thing is moving. I mean, it was one thing... It was one thing when it was private, in your bedroom, at home, but now it's in the, it's in the schools. Now we're trying to make it okay with, with five-year-olds. Are you listening to this? This is demonic. And there's a great separation taking place right now. But we're going to be on the right side. Amen. Say it with me. I'm going to be on the right side. Come on, stand up on your feet. You know, it's amazing to me. When I preach certain ways, I'm not sitting at home at night trying to say I'm going to be bold and fervent today. You know, I'm not sitting at home and saying, you know, when can I, when can I bam this thing in the spirit? What happens is that I'm responding to the anointing. And the anointing is dealing with the spiritual climate in our region. So sometimes we have to say, hey, you know, Apostle Jonas is not getting on our case. He's getting on that thing's case. So it's not, I'm, not, I'm not getting on anybody's case here. I'm hitting what's in the spirit around us. Because these devils are trying, these are deceitful spirits that are trying to steal, kill, and destroy. And you know what we got to do? We can't just say, well, that's Apostle Jonas' ministry. Because no, it's not. 
No, it's not. Don't put that on me. How do you say together we stand? How do you say together we stand in Spanish? Unidos juntos. Unidos juntos, okay? Unidos juntos. Somebody say, Unidos juntos. And then how do you say divided we fall? Dividos. Dividos callemos. Dividos callemos. Okay, we're not. So united we stand, divided we fall. It's called unity. Somebody say, we need the unity. Look at somebody and tell them, I'm with you. Don't break rank. God needs you. Tell the person you matter. Tell them you are important. Tell them God needs you. Say it again. You're important. You matter. God needs you. Stay in the race. Represent God. Be the head, not the tail. Be above, not beneath. Be blessed. Coming in. Blessed. Going out. Shout amen. Amen. Come on, give God a hand clap. Hallelujah. 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 Lift up your hands here in this congregation. Father, we thank you today that we can listen to what the Spirit of God is saying to us and the churches. Lord, I thank you for the 144 that are watching. Let it be 144,000, God, in Jesus' name. Lord, let us understand how important we are to stand in the gap and make up the hedge. Let us be the representatives, God, that we can show this next generation what a man of God looks like, what a woman of God looks like. Lord, thank you that you're the great healer. You heal our broken hearts. You heal us, God, from the powers of rejection, from the abuse that we've suffered. But, Lord, we will not live in the past. We will not live in the past, but we enter our future in Jesus' name. And we enter in victoriously. Thank you, Lord God. No weapon formed against no weapon formed against us can prosper. Every word curse spoken against us broken in Jesus' name. Lord, thank you, God, that we are expanding. We are increasing, God. We are becoming more and more prosperous. And we thank you, Lord God, that you have given us kingdom assignments. And we will not put anything else first but we agree with your word in Matthew 6 33 seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be given to us and Lord we believe that you have called us out of darkness into light thank you God that you have given us purpose thank you that the entrance of your word brings light Lord you said if we abide in you and your words abide in us that we could ask whatsoever we will and it would be given to us. Herein is my Father well pleased that you bear much fruit showing yourself to be my disciples. Thank you, Lord God. You said if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all of us freely and upbraideth us not. Thank you, Lord God. We can draw upon your wisdom. Holy Spirit, thank you that you have anointed each and every one of us. Thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit working in our life God Holy Spirit we will not forsake you but we will embrace you Holy Spirit we will not deny you but we will embrace you thank you Holy Spirit we will not be self-centered but we will listen to you and your voice hallelujah for you said those that are led by the Spirit of God they are the sons of God father thank you for the Phillips that arise up in this hour Thank you for the apostles and the prophets, the evangelists, pastors, teachers, the priests and the kings. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God, for the new Joshua's to come alive. Oh, Joshua's come alive in Jesus' name. Lord, we speak into this other generation and we say, let light shine into your life, into your generation in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you, God, we will not have idols set before you. We will not have idols set before you. There will be no other idols in our life, but we tear down the idols, the strongholds of we, the people around us, according to your word, God. And we thank you, Lord God, what you're doing inside of us. Your word prevails. Your word prevails. The seed of the gospel prevails in us, and the seed knows what to do. And Lord, even when we're challenged and even though sometimes we are fearful, fearful God, we can declare and decree, let the weak say, I am strong. Let the weak say, I am strong. Let the weak say, I am strong. Hallelujah. Shakara by you. Let's worship God with a song before we dismiss today. Thank you, Lord. You got a mic?
Come over here and help me sing. Thank you, Lord God. You are Alpha and Omega. You are Alpha and Omega. You're the beginning and the end. You're the beginning and the end. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I pray. I pray. Your name. Your name. You're the beginning and the end. You're the beginning and the end. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I pray. I pray.
God's going to use me this week. The Lord has anointed me for such a time as this. I cannot fail. I am unstoppable. Thank you, Lord God. You're not giving me a spirit of fear, but of love and power and a sound mind. Now somebody shout yes. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Well, God bless you. You're dismissed. We'll see you on Friday.